quick question for you. If you want to pull out your phones, you're more than welcome to. Adrian, you already have your phone out, so that's perfect. Um, I'm just... <laughs> oh! Oh, from the pulpit. <laughs> okay. Um, why don't you check on my phone? Uh, I know I'll check on your phone. What was the last emoji that somebody sent you? For some of you, it might be like the immediate text. Some of you might be like, I don't know. Who is the person who always sends the emojis? Um, I'm curious, you know, what you last received. If, if someone wants to share, they can. If you don't, that's totally fine. But anyone have an emoji that they just received? Angry face. I received an angry face? <laughs> the laughing crying. The laughing crying. That's been huge lately. Everyone's about the laughing crying. Anyone else? A Canadian flag. Oh, interesting. <laughs> the Canadian flag. Maria. Um, some hearts, I love it. I, I was thinking about this and thinking about how expressive we are by emoji. And I don't know how often you've communicated or interacted with somebody who has been laughing so much that they've been crying. So I, I, sometimes I get emojis for people and it's like, I hardly even get like a, a hearty laugh out of people. But their emojis just like, tears everywhere, they're so, like laughing all the time. It's, it's, it's a curious thing how bold we are in expressing ourselves through emojis. And then you talk with one another, and all the time, like, how are you doing? Like, I'm good. And it's like, can you get that to me in an emoji? Like, no, how are you doing? Like, not just like a straight face, you can't like... So it's interesting to me how uh, more comfortable we are in expressing ourselves digitally, if you will, or, you know, on your story on Facebook, like, oh, I'll throw a hug, and it's like, you're not even a huggy person. <laughs> When in person, we're a little bit more reticent, right? It's like, uh, I'm not sure if I'm going to open up and share actually how I'm doing. And I think there's a lot of reasons for that. And I think part of it is that we don't really know what to do with our emotions. For some of us who were here on Friday night watching Encanto, which was great, and for those of you, whether you watch or not, I'm sure you picked up on the fact that there are things that we don't talk about, right? There are things in our lives, in our families, that are just sort of like off limits. Like, don't bring that up. We don't talk about Bruno or whatever it is in our family. And, and for so many of us, probably all of us, we, we know that's so true. That there are just things you don't bring up. And oftentimes, emotions might even be that thing. Or it's something in your family or your life that creates a lot of emotions within And sadly, over the history of the church, uh, our stoic, Puritan values have often diminished or trivialized our little emotions as human beings. Rather than honoring and discovering the richness and the beauty of this aspect of what it means to be human. So our goal through the next six weeks is to, to close the gap between what we say we believe and what we experience. That we wouldn't leave the church talking about the indwelling Holy Spirit and then berate our neighbor or belittle our spouse or friends and begin this cycle all over again and then you feel guilty and you're like, oh my goodness, I'm just doing this over and over again. Is there any way for this to change? And praise God that he has given us signposts to our soul and messengers to say, hey, there's something going on in your soul, in the center of your being, in the place of your emotions and your attachments. There's something happening, and those signposts are our emotions. And God wants to bring healing and wholeness to them. Emotions are a door to reality, and frankly, a lot of us want to avoid reality. It's not a particularly pleasant place to be oftentimes because we, we feel the brokenness around us, within us. We feel the sense that we're on this journey of faith and we're, we're far more wanderers than we are at home. And that's, that's how scripture describes us. We're, we're going someplace. This is not our, our permanent place where we just reside. And we feel this dissonance within us. But our emotions are a vital 
part of being human? But are they a valued part of being human? This morning we are going to be laying some groundwork for the rest of this series. And we're going to be discussing about why our emotions are necessary. We're going to look briefly at scripture. And we're actually going to look a lot more at science. So I'm stepping into a field that I am not an expert in by any means. I just want to declare from the outset, I am not a mental health expert. So there are probably people in your life who know way more than I do. And I've been talking with people and reading extensively because I want to know, what does it mean for me to be human? What does it mean for us as a body of believers to be fully who God wants me to be? But I don't want you to walk away and be like, Pastor Isaac said this, and he's a pastor, so he's the expert on that. Like, I'm not a mental health expert. I'm a follower of Jesus wanting to discover more about how God has created me and how God has redeemed me. So we're going to look at scripture. We're going to look at our brain, our memory, emotions, how they're related. And then we're going to come back to scripture at the end and close with communion. But if you would turn with me to 1 Thessalonians Chapter 5, verses 23 to 24. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verses 23 to, through 24. Paul is writing to the church of Thessalonica. Stephanie, am I saying that right? Okay. I kept going back and forth. To a group of believers who are eagerly anticipating the return of Jesus. And think about this group of believers. I mean, they, they put their faith in this crucified and risen Messiah who has promised that he's going to be coming back. And they are in this city that has all sorts of cults and deities, and there's a lot of pressure to conform. And they're saying, we're ready for him to come back. Like, we're, is this going to happen today or tomorrow? There's this expectancy. And throughout their, their time, people are beginning to die. And they're saying, okay, hold up. What does it look like to follow Jesus in this in-between time? And And Paul is encouraging them. It looks like living holy lives. It looks like consistently pursuing Jesus and living in light of the reality that he is on the throne. And yes, he's coming back. And in the meantime, we are to live devoted to him, holy lives. And at the end, in, in chapter 5, Paul has this prayer. Where he says, now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. He who calls you is faithful. He will do it. Word of the Lord. Praise be to God. So after spending time calling the Thessalonian church to live in their new identity in Christ, Paul prays that the God of peace the God who has brought an end to our hostility with God through the person of his son. God has done it all so that we can have peace with him. We respond in faith. He's saying, would that God of peace sanctify you completely? And we know that peace leads to flourishing. We see this going on in Ukraine right now where there's the absence of peace and the devastation that that entails for families who are serving on the front lines, losing their lives, or the, the commerce that isn't happening because there's not peace. And we, we long for there to be peace not only there, but elsewhere in the world so that flourishing can occur. And God longs for there to be peace between us and Him, so He has done everything necessary for that to happen. And Paul prays that that God, the God of peace, Himself will sanctify you completely. Sanctification is setting apart for a holy purpose. It takes place at salvation when we put our faith and trust in Jesus Christ. We're set apart for his purpose to be used by him. But then it's also this process that takes place throughout our entire life. I think about it like when you become an employee at a, at a job and you're an employee. You're set apart for the purpose of working there. But it takes time to sort of be a part of the culture. It takes time for you to be like the guy that like, hey man, that person represents the company. Like you talk to them, that is, that's that person through and through. You talk to Jeremy, it's like the ICI, Jeremy, like this. You know, because you've been there a long time. 
It's sort of like that with sanctification. We're set apart. We're in the, the family of God. But then that work takes place in us. Paul's saying, would he sanctify you completely? Every part of your being being devoted to the purposes of God. Unless we miss the fact that he means every part of our being, he continues on. May your whole spirit, soul, and body be kept sound and blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Paul's saying, would that part of you, the, the, the spirit, the immaterial part of you, would that be sanctified? Would your body be sanctified? And then he said, would your soul be sanctified as well? The, the Greek for that is where we get the word for, for psyche. And it's that part of us where our desires, our emotions, our affections reside. You say, would, would God take every part of who we are as human beings and would he sanctify it completely? Like you drive down and you see building projects that have been like a project for a really long time. And it's like, I don't know if funding ran out, I don't know if it was like some sort of conflict or fallout, something happened, but it just sort of makes you sad. Like this should have been really awesome. This looks really cool, but for whatever reason, it's not being finished to completion. And as followers of Jesus, we want his work to be done to completion. Like that last nail is pounded. It's like, ah, we're set apart, holy, sanctified. And emotions is a huge part of it. Just like every other part of us, our emotions have experienced the disintegration that comes from sin, the, the tearing apart, the this is not how things were meant to be of sin. And for many of us, this disconnect of our emotions is, is maybe the, one of the most keenly felt parts of sin. And God wants to bring wholeness to that part of our lives as well. Before I jump into talking about the brain and the science, I just want to sort of mention a couple mistaken notions of emotions, is how I'm phrasing them. And this is not an exhaustive list, and I actually cut things out because I just couldn't be going on for a long time. The first is this, is that God doesn't experience emotion. I think it's really easy to assume that God doesn't experience emotion or only experiences like very few, and we just sort of put certain ones on him that we, that we ascribe him. God is rich with emotion. He's not like out of control. It's not like he's like, I have no idea what to do. I just woke up this morning and I'm super angry. That's not who our God is. He's not capricious. He's rich in emotions and perfect in his emotions. And he's created us in his image, also rich with emotions. Praise God. Secondly, they are not neutral. Right there. I have my notes there. That's not, that's not correct. It's the second one. Put a, put a knot in it, right? <laughs> now, what I mean by this, in, in one sense, they are neutral. In the sense of, hey, anger is not a bad emotion or a good emotion just inherently. Like, it depends. Like, sometimes it's the proper response and sometimes it's not. So in that sense, neutral. But in the sense that it has been contaminated by sin, just like every other part of our being. Emotions are not just like, ah, oh, they're not touched by sin. Just like every part of us, which is a really freeing thing, because then it means, good morning, Millie, it's good to see you. Good morning, my friend. Because then it means God wants to bring morning, redemption everyone. and flourishing to this part of our lives as well. The third one is that emotions can't be trusted. Yeah. Mm -hmm. How many of you have been in conversations where people will say, like, come on, let's just be reasonable about it? Like, just give me the data, and we'll just make a logical, reasonable decision. You're like, but something doesn't sit right inside of me. Mm -hmm. I might be somebody who more often could say, let's be reasonable, so I want to be careful that I'm not just like conveniently jumping in the other, other camp. But we've been in those situations where it's, that is prioritizing. And wouldn't it be just funny to be like, can somebody just be emotional? For a moment before we make a decision about this. Kurt Thompson says this about our emotions that they are an authentic reflection of our subjective experience, one that is best served by attending to it. Two more I want to mention 
This, this next one is that positive emotions are right emotions and negative emotions are bad emotions. Or vice versa. Yeah. That we're called to just be happy and joyful as followers of Jesus at all times. It's not true. Or that if I am happy and joyful, like, what's wrong with me? Do you see everything going on? And we're called to carry each other's burdens. And so oftentimes we just feel guilty one way or the other. Like, man, I'm guilty if I'm feeling happy and I'm guilty if I'm feeling bad because I don't know what to do with my emotions. Yeah. I love you too. Love you. <laughs> the last one is this, that holy emotions are suppressed emotions. Wow. We... Uh, sort of idolize people who can just keep their cool no matter what, yeah. who are stoic in the face of great adversity. And there's a need for that, and that's not always a bad thing. Right. But sometimes we can think that healthy emotions are suppressed emotions and are not expressed emotions, and that is not true. Amen. How holy and healthy emotions are emotions that are integrated in a healthy they are not a problem to be fixed. They are a cry to be attended to. One person says, emotions are the language of the soul. Amen. They are the cry that gives the heart a voice. To understand our deepest passions and convictions, we must learn to listen to the cry of the soul. Listening to our emotions ushers us into reality, and reality is where we meet God. If we want to know God, we must ponder and struggle with our feelings to gain an understanding of the passions that rule us. Nothing illuminates the ruling passions of our heart as dramatically or clearly as our emotions. Amen. So, beloved, our emotions are given to us as a gift from God. Amen. As a gift from God to, to know and be known by Him, not just factually, but experientially. And to be known and to know those around us. John Chrysostom, this old-time pastor, back in the day, like 2nd century B.C., real early on, or A.D., I should say, should say, he said this, find the door of your heart, and you will discover it is the door of the kingdom of God. Amen. Find the door of your heart, not somebody else's. We always want to bring people into the door of our hearts. Yeah. Find the door of your heart, that thing that says, I'm passionate about this, gives me life, I care, find that thing. Yes. And that's where God wants to meet you. That's where he wants his kingdom to come in and thrive in that place of your life. Mm -hmm. yes. So let's talk about our body. Let's talk about our brain. Let's talk about who God created us to be. Because it's also what science discovers. And people are like, science is so cool. Science is really cool. God is really cool. He created us and created science. Um, and praise God for, for what he's done in creating us. I've been in awe this week. The first thing I just want to talk about is, is our brain. And the structure of our brain. You have a left side and a right side. Yes. And it, this could be viewed as too simplistic, but I think it's very, very helpful in thinking through how God has made us. The, the left side is a lot more logical. It's rational, it's thinking through, it's your language, um, it's very linear, it's that person who's like, be reasonable, left side, real strong, and very, you know, value in our culture, and let's, let's just stick to the facts, where your right side is more like random, intuitive, holistic, where your left side steps away and says, like, let me observe and critique and da -da -da, yeah. let me be yeah. distant yeah. from your right side engages and says, like, I'm part of this. Your right side steps into a room and says, like, something's off. Yeah. I don't know why, and I'm not even necessarily concerned with just how and all the reasons. I'm just concerned with the fact that it doesn't feel right. Mm -hmm. And God has created us with all of that. He didn't create us with, like, this is more value than the, the right side. But let's be honest, what is more valued in our culture? And by valued, I don't just mean like theoretically, like literally people make more money if they're more left side focused, right? Like if you can get stuff done and explain and this and this, like that is more valued in our culture. How really the right side too. So you have these left side and right side part of your brain that are meant to be integrated. You also have a sort of 
bottom up, top down, three parts to your brain. Have another slide behind us, and you know, don't get too weirded out by lizard mammal brain. But the, the bottom part we share with reptiles. It's your brain stem, your cerebellum. Okay. And that's the fight or flight part. This is like the automatic part of your body. You're driving in the road, somebody pulls. I was actually that somebody this week. Webster changes at some point and becomes not a two-way. And I turned and I went one way, and there's just a car there. It's like, whoa, whoa. It's the part of your brain that says, I gotta just do something. Like, you don't have time to think about it, you just respond. Do I just swerve here, swerve there? That's your brain stem kicking in. The second part, your mammal brain, the limbic system, this is where your emotions and your memories habits, your attachments, these reside in this place. Still not the, the, the cognitive, like you're not thinking too, you, you walk through and you're just like, yep, something feels, feels off. This is very similar to your right side of your brain as well. Something, something's amiss. And we'll get to this more later when we talk about memories. And then lastly, the, the human Part that is unique to human beings, the neocortex. And this is the abstract, this is the rational you're thinking through. You're saying, okay, I immediately felt this like concern, a car is coming, but I actually noticed that they, they're stopped. This is your neocortex kicking in and saying, like, assess the whole situation and make a, a reasoned decision. Um, and we need all of these to influence each other. You're in the woods, you see a stick, and your first thought is it's a snake, and you're like, run. Fight or flight, your, your lizard brain's like, get out of here, or fight it. No. no, you need your neocortex to come in and be like, calm down, it's just, it's just a stick. Mm. Other times when you're like, man, I just can't explain why, but there's something going on here, like I'm remembering something, I can't remember all the details that you need your, your uh, limbic system to balance it out as well. You need to hone in and pay attention to that. Yeah. And so while all of this is happening, you have these brain cells, these neurons firing along and connecting to one another. And this is where we get information. Like when you think of thought, there's a connection with your neurons that happens, and this is information, and this is going on all the time. You have like 100 billion neurons, and they have these little gaps in between each other that when you remember that is like connected, and there's a pathway, and the more you remember, the more it's connected, and now it's like a highway. This is all going on in here all the time. We're super complex beings. So it's a little bit about our, our brain. Man, I feel so like teachery, lectury, and I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not sure how I feel about that. Um, but I told myself, don't get it, don't get it. I told myself, right don't get into preach mode about like the nervous system and I'm just like, wow. stay calm, tranquil, <laughs> tranquilo, I said. So you have that going on in your brain, you also have the nervous system, and I just want to mention two things, um, mostly because that's pretty much all I know about the nervous system, but also really ties in with what's going on here as well. Your parenthetic and your sympathetic system. And your parenthetic or your sympathetic nervous system, this is your accelerator. This is your like, hey, church started three minutes ago, and I have five minutes before I even get out of the house. Let's go, like teeth crossed, boom, 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 boom. And then even if you're on the street and somebody cuts you off and you're like, shh, I'm literally gonna like accelerate and be on this person's bumper the whole way. Like, is that, that part of you, your heart rate rises, your pupils are dilating. This is happening in your body. Conversely, your parasympathetic nervous system are the brakes. It's like, well, let's just slow down. And you know, like, when you're around people who are, like, constantly accelerating versus people who are constantly just, like, pumping the brakes. When we need all kinds, we need all of this in our life. Praise God. So our brain and our body our mind and our body process the complexity of our stories. Oh, no. <laughs> Sounded interesting. <laughs> Save it for Sunday afternoon. 
Okay, and before I talk about memory, I just want to pause for a moment and say, why are we talking about this? Because most of our lived experience is in this realm, right? Yeah. When you go to work tomorrow, and maybe you had conflict with your coworker, and you walk in and you're already feeling like a... Got it. That's Can everyone just make sure you turn your phones off? Yeah. Can um, we just pause and do that? Thank you. I'm dis discovering my props and have the rule of like phones outside. I keep them there. Oh, never work if I wear class. Um, but it matters because when you go to work tomorrow morning and you walk through the door and you're like, your heart rate is rising and you're sweating and you're like, Man, why, why is this? Why, what's going on? And you don't think it was a really big deal that you had that conflict with your boss or your coworker. And you're just like, I just need to remember a scripture verse or like something. It's because this is how God has made us. Yes. This is part of what it means to be human. Amen. And this is where we need to be attuned to how God has made us. Because yes. he wants to do a work in that place. And so for me, it's really helpful knowing this. Because it's like, ah, this makes a lot more sense what you call this to God and how you've made us. So next, I just briefly want to talk about memory. Memory, which, think about those neurons, right? Those connections. One person said this, neurons that fire together, wire together. And when you have a memory, a, a, a pathway is created. And that memory literally is how you anticipate, plan for the future. And you have two main uh, kinds of memory. You have implicit memory. This is this person just like singing a song. He knows all the lyrics. He's been singing it since he was four years old. He doesn't have to remember. It's just there. Or you get on your bike, and even if it's been years and years, you know how to ride that bike. It's that implicit memory kicking in, which isn't just random. This is the, the neurons in your brain that are hardened. They're there automatically. Or maybe it's that, you know, for your whole life, you've first saw it in your parents that when somebody had a contrary opinion and then somebody else got mad and then you shut down and this is how you respond when somebody gets angry, you shut down because of this implicit memory. This is just how your, your brain is wired. So that's implicit memory. You also have ex explicit memory. This is far more the, the information, the dates, the facts, like when is that person's memory or when is that person's birthday? You're not thinking like oh, implicit memory. You're like, I know it's in August, I know, oh, yes, August 23rd, it's my oldest brother's birthday, got it. Right. Passing of time, distinct memories. And we have all of this. And this hugely affects our emotions. Amen. Our minds and our bodies process the complexity of our stories with the activity of our emotions. Let me just create a scenario of how our emotions and our memory are attached to one another. And I'm walking back here because I want you to imagine somebody walks through or up the door, up the stairs, through the door, and they come over to get coffee. And instead of being like warmly greeted and respected by our amazing coffee tea, it's like a weaker circle over here. Where somebody's like, we're all out of coffee. <laughs> Whoa. Okay. And your your fight flight, your lizard brain kicks in like, hold up. Like, well, why are you over here at coffee station? Like, you're thinking, do I do that? Do I just retreat? But either way, you feel a certain way. So you're, the, the mammal brain, those memories, that, that feeling is kicking in. You're like, oh. You come to church the next week, and the same thing happens. You're like, I don't really know about this. <laughs> and you're like, you know what? I will give it a third time. Isaac said that this three-week challenge. I'm going to come a third time. But you know this because you're remembering, right? You have these, these neurons that are fired together. So if you're thinking about going to church, you're like, I probably don't even go to the coffee station. I'll just play it safe. And that person probably, you know, really needs Jesus or something. I don't know. <laughs> but you notice you're like nervous. You're feeling a certain way about coming to church. And you're walking up the stairs and you're finding yourself like tense. And you're finding your heart rate's rising a little bit. You're like, I really hope, I really hope I don't see that person. And you look over at the coffee just quickly. They're not there. And you're like, praise God, God saw the situation. And you sit down, and then that person walks in and sits right next to you. 
and you feel all of these emotions, you're like, God, you tell me if I'm going to come to church like this is a good thing, and I'm here, and I am not feeling Christian right now. <laughs> my lizard brain is real strong, and I've had time to think about what I want to say, so my neocortex is kicking in, and like, let's go. Let's talk about what's wrong with you. All of this is happening. And sadly, and I think oftentimes we don't really know what to do or like why this is happening, we just sort of say like, you know, don't be anxious for anything, and we like insert a scripture verse, and now we heap guilt onto it, because we're like, I'm feeling anxiety, I'm feeling all of these ways, and the scripture verse says I shouldn't, and it's just compounded. And I use it, and it's sort of a silly example, but I use it because I know that a lot of us, all of us, have had experiences in the church, outside of the church, mm -hmm. that things happen, yeah. trauma occurs, yeah. and those memories are attached to your emotions. Mm -hmm. They're like intimately connected. Yes. And as you're remembering, as you're trying to go through your life, <coughs> Those memories are what is helping you anticipate, plan for, prepare for the future. Yeah. How can we experience change? And this is like, all of that is just like super base, like try not to get in the weeds. If you want more information, let me know. Talk with Tracy and Laura and others. Yeah. How can we experience change? Praise God that he has created us in such, in such a way that we can experience change. Amen. Amen. That we can. Jimmy, could you hold up the kids downstairs so they can come up? You know all those neurons in our brain? All those pathways that are like highways that are wired, fired together, wired together? God has created us in such a way that those can actually change. That new pathways can be formed. And so I just want to make two suggestions of things that we can do to help be more integrated people. And the first one is this, and I'm using the term mindfulness because I don't just want to jump to a Christianese term. And a therapist, theologian described it this way. He said it's a simple concept that means to stop, take a break. And focus our thoughts on one thing. We can use mindfulness throughout the day to ground ourselves when our body is telling us we're anxious, scared, angry, or any other emotion. It helps us notice what thoughts might be driving our emotions and how our behaviors might be a product of our unnoticed thoughts and emotions. Prayer, for me, is an important way to practice mindfulness. Instead of distracting myself with a task or running to social media, prayer pro provides a space and time to stop, mentally check my body, notice how I'm really feeling, and turn my thoughts to the one who knows how I'm doing is, and is in control of it. Amen. So we handed out the emotional yeah. wheels, the stickers. And I encourage you, put that somewhere where you will see it often. And that might not be your journal or your Bible. Like, put it on your fridge. But I encourage you, use that. Maybe it's once a day to begin. Maybe it's once a week on your, your Sabbath day. You say, you know what, I'm going to sit down and I'm going to look at this chart and I'm going to, to learn words to articulate how I'm feeling. And I'm going to think through, why am I feeling this way? When have I felt this way before? And I'm going to think through my body, how is, how is it feeling? God, what are you wanting to speak to me about how I'm doing? And you begin to engage with God in prayer, bringing him into this part of you that he's known all along. Yes. He's created you. Amen. He has rich emotions. Amen. So the first thing is attending to your emotions. Secondly, sharing your story with others. Because what can cause your neural pathways to change, and literally your memories to change, is by sharing your stories, not just with anyone, and you need to be careful because you can share your stories with somebody that reinforces it in a really negative way, but sharing your stories with a caring, empathetic listener, because here's what happens. 
Let's say you have a story that when you were young, before you even knew what was going on, you were neglected. You were cared for as you should be. And as you grew older, there were times that you needed a person in your life to listen, to say like, hey, I care about you, what's going on? And that person wasn't there. Or that person actually was asking you to care for them. Amen. And so now when you are remembering that, when you're trying to, to move forward in the future, Amen. what's happening is you're like, but I need somebody to care for me. Amen. I need somebody to sit and listen to me. So every time you remember it, it's reinforced. But, you guys got this, you can pay attention. I know you can. <laughs> but when you experience an empathetic listener, when you sit down with somebody who says, wait, tell me how you felt? Yeah. When was that? When else have you felt that? When you begin to experience that, what happens is your neurons in your brain begin to make new pathways. They begin to make new pathways. That what was fired before to say that nobody cares, what was so hardened to say, nobody cares about me, and I'm sure God doesn't want me to bring this up, because you're talking with an empathetic listener, yeah. that is beginning to change. That when you remember that story from your childhood, something will click and say, no, there is somebody who cares. Amen. There is somebody who cares. No, I believe God might care because I sat with an empathetic listener. Amen. Not just somebody who sat and gave you all of the reasons, like, well, sin. And good and evil. And let me explain. And, and this verse says this. And I don't want to diminish the power of scripture by any means. But we don't just need explanations for everything. We need to be felt. We need somebody to step in and say, I'm, I'm so sorry that happened to you. Like, let, you, let me just sit with you for a moment. We cry with you. And what happens when you share your story, both the facts and the feelings, is that your brain becomes more integrated. Yeah. Because you're sharing your facts from the left side, and you're sharing your feelings from the right side, and this brings healing and wholeness. Yeah. Sin disintegrates. Redemption, the power of the Holy Spirit wants to bring integration. So when you're sharing the story, that's what happens. And what's crazy is when you share your story, and somebody's listening, their limbic system, their mammal part of their brain, literally brings regulation to your brain, praise God. That when you're, you're sharing and they're listening and allowing you to share and asking good questions, their brain is affecting your brain. Yeah. It's bringing calm and peace. We were singing about Psalm 23. Our God who brings us beside peaceful waters, that might be a listening ear. Hello. Attending to your emotions. Sharing your story with others. Scripture has been telling us this all along when it describes us as a family, as a, as a body, as a people of God. When it says rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those, with th th those who weep, Scripture's been telling us that we need this for healing and wholeness. And before I ask Stephanie to come up, I just want to close in talking about our God. Who our verse this morning says, He who calls you is faithful, he will do it. Our God, in the person of Jesus Christ, when he experienced sorrow and grief, when his friend died, Lazarus, yeah. and he's going to the tomb and he's talking with his friends, Martha and Mary. And Martha, he interacts a lot more left brain. But Mary comes and she's just weak. She's just weeping, and the people around her are weeping. And John says this, in the Gospel of John, says, When Jesus saw her weeping, and the Jews who had come with her also weeping, he was deeply moved in his spirit and greatly troubled. And he said, Where have you laid me? And they said to him, Lord, come and see. And Scripture wouldn't have to note the next two words. Scripture could have moved on if it wanted to present a stoic God. But scripture says this, Jesus wept. Before he went and raised Lazarus from the dead, he wept. And this wasn't just a like, Mary, I'm so sorry. Like, Jesus is weeping. Like, 
snot is slobbering everywhere. Jesus is <laughs> weeping with her. Because he knows that we don't just need explanations. Yeah. He knows that we don't just need it to be fixed. Right. He knows that we need to be felt as people. He knows we need a God who can sit with us and say, I feel what you're going through. That healing isn't just raising Lazarus from the dead. That healing occurs in sitting with you in this moment and weeping. And some of you are in that moment where you say, yes, I want things to be fixed. And I want that for you. And I wish that would happen today. But we have a God who says, in the meantime, I want you to know that I'm feeling with you. Yeah. Amen. I'm feeling with you. And science is catching up and letting us know, wow, that actually brings healing to our brains. And God has created us all along. Yes. Yeah. That we would know him. That we would know the love that he has. That's yes. right. That's strong as that conquers them. And that is our God who is faithful. And he will. Stephanie, you want to come up and sing? The worship team, you want to come up?